So I was driving down the road about uh, a week ago and I saw this billboard and I actually had to do a double take because I could not believe what this billboard said. It said, life short, get a divorce. But it just sat there and kind of festered on me. I was thinking about it on the drive. I randomly thought about it throughout the week. This billboard perfectly summed up exactly how the world is thinking today. Life short, get a divorce. But more so, I wanna hit on what that thing, what that billboard is really saying. Because what that billboard is really saying is, hey, you do what makes you happy. You're sick and tired of arguing with your spouse. You're sick of living for somebody else. <laughs> you do you, do what makes you happy. That old mantra, follow your heart. We know what the Bible says about the heart, and it says it's deceitfully wicked above all things. And honestly, in an unbeliever's mind, that billboard makes perfect sense. Because if you don't believe in God, if you don't believe in a higher power period, if you don't believe there's a moral standard that we have to follow that was given to us from God, then why not just live for yourself? Why not say life short, get a divorce? Who cares if you're gonna ruin your kids' lives? Who cares if you're gonna ruin your spouse's lives? Who cares if you're gonna ruin your own life? Because guess what? It's your own life and you can do whatever you want with it. Life short. In other words, they're saying, there ain't nothing after this. Life short. Do what makes you happy. Get a divorce. Why be shackled down once again by somebody else? Why shackle yourself down to something as obscure and not relevant to today like the Bible or God or faith or Christianity here? That's really what that billboard's saying. Now, obviously, this is lawyers trying to make some money off a very degenerate society. I mean, I, I honestly feel bad for lawyers in a way because they go up there and they defend blatant lies a lot of times. I would love it if lawyers were up there defending the truth 100% of the time, but guess what? As a lawyer, your job is to figure out loopholes or whatever the case may be within the law to defend your client, whether they are morally right or wrong. That's what lawyers do. And you can put this with any profession, honestly, any profession that propagates things that are against the Bible. But it just testifies to what the world is today. Look out for yourself and nobody else. Honestly, it reminds me of Romans chapter uh, 1, verses 18 through 32, where over and over and over again, if you read that section, all you are going to see is God gave them up, God gave them up, God gave them up, God gave them up. In other words, God wasn't sitting there pouring out his wrath through craziness. God was pouring out his wrath through abandonment. What does that look like? That's essentially where God goes, you know what? You want to do what you want to do? Go ahead, see where it gets you. A lot of times people look at the world, they see tragedy and they wanna look at God and blame him. When in reality, they need to look at humanity and their evilness and blame that. God restrains evil all the time through governments, through the law, through consequences for your actions. You know, you do this, well, this could possibly happen to you. You know, you steal, you could get caught. You have unprotected sex, you could get an STD. Whatever the case may be. There are multiple ways to restrain evil that God uses all the time. But it comes to a point where people start banging up against the glass wall more and more and more because they see what's on the outside and they want out, they want out, they want out until they finally get out there and realize this isn't what they really want. They're miserable. I, mean, I can look at Hollywood and just see that today. Everybody clamors over Hollywood. They see the money, they see the fame, the popularity, they're on TV shows. Look at their lives. A lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them are a mess. Getting divorced left and right, drugs, party lifestyle, all that stuff is empty. There's no real fulfillment there. Just like that sign. Life's short. Get a divorce. There's nothing after this. Live for yourself. Live selfishly. Live for yourself. Life short. Get a divorce. It's so 
sad to see that. Because there was a time when this country, although probably, you know, wasn't as Christian as we thought it was, but there was a time in this country where they at least pretended, <laughs> you know, they at least acknowledged God. They didn't submit to him as Lord and follow him, but they at least acknowledged him. Now you don't even do it, especially when it comes to values that we have as Christians that are really passed down through the Bible. A good example of this is, hey, just stop calling it a sin. If we stop calling whatever this is a sin, you name it, whatever type of sin you can think of, whether it be drugs, homosexuality, stealing, uh, you name it. Stop calling it a sin. Let's make it normal. Let's put some commercials out there and some TV shows and whatever, and we make this as normal as possible, and it's no longer a sin. You don't need to be ashamed of it anymore. It's not a sin because we said it's not a sin. Who cares what God has to say about it? That's what's going on. And we see it in society more and more and more. There was a time where when you got a divorce, that was shameful. You were ashamed to get a divorce because you broke a promise. You broke a vow. You said, I'm not going to live for myself anymore. I'm going to live for you. And I'm going to live for the kids. Now, not today's world. You do you. Life short. Get a divorce. It's so, so sad. You know, that passage, Romans 1, 18 through 32, I've always likened it to a dog on a leash. You ever have a dog and it's on a leash and it may be a younger puppy and it's just trying to get away all the time. You know, it's on the leash, it's pulling, it's pulling, it's pulling. But you have that dog on a leash, not because you want to torture the poor thing, but because you care about it. And you don't want it to run out in the road and get hit by a truck or get lost or whatever the case may be. It's kind of the same way with God and us. God is restraining evil. He's restraining our own evil and he's holding it back even those who are unsaved, but they keep pulling and pulling and pulling, wanting to get to what they think is going to make them happy. Oh, if I just divorce my husband, I know I'll be happier. This is what God wants me to do. Oh, if I just had more money, I know I'll be more happy. Oh, if I just had this, oh, if I just had that, you name it, money, fame, power, sex, whatever the case may be, they think they want it, and so they pander after it, and they pawn after it, and they keep jerking on the leash to go get it, and eventually, God's going to let that leash go. And if you read Romans 1, 18 through 32, you see God starts loosening up the leash a little bit, letting a little bit more line out, letting a little bit more out, letting a little bit more out, and to the point where he just goes ahead and says, you know what, I tried to help you out, I tried to show you the right way but you want to do what is right in your own eyes. I'm just going to let the leash go. Let's see where that gets you. And that's essentially what we're seeing in our country today. You might find this true in your own country as well, but I truly believe God has abandoned America. Now, that's not to say that at some point we could turn back, repent of our ways as a nation, and turn back to God. I truly believe we can but as of now, personal opinion, I believe we're so far gone to the point where God just let the leash go. I mean, we have, for crying out loud, we have boys trying to compete in girls' sports in high school because they think they're girls. How twisted is that? You have parents propagating little kids when they're running off saying, uh, dressing them up in girls' clothes, tell, telling them they're girls when they're boys. Clearly, you have men sleeping with other men, women sleeping with other women. What the Bible says going against the natural function, doing dishonorable things, it says. And what's the result of that? Well, at least for the men's side, it says receiving the penalty in them for which they are due. What do you think that is? Well, you don't have to open up Google search to figure out which group of people have the highest STD rates when it comes to things, say, such as AIDS. It's one community. Another example, look at the young trans community. Very high rate and a lot of people say that's because of bullying that's because you're not accepting well guess what this country is becoming more and more accepting propagating whatever the case may be but guess what it's still not going down drug use in that community is still high sides in that community are still high why because it's not right and instead of correcting them and telling them that this is not right we instead endorse their sin and say you do you 
Life's short. Get a divorce. And just because somebody may sit there and say, well, I don't do that stuff. I mean, I don't have a problem if they do, but I don't do that stuff personally myself, you know, whatever, but I don't have a problem with that. Romans chapter 1, verse 32. And although they know the righteous requirements of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but key words right here, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. You can pretty much surmise that if you give approval to those doing this, it's wrong. People have ultimately replaced God with a God of their own mind, and they will either, one, call that God of their own mind atheism and say, there is no God, I'm my own personal God, or two, they'll create a God of their own mind and call it some name, you know? A lot of times, people will call their own God Jesus. Oh, I believe in Jesus. Oh, my Jesus doesn't do that. I know that's in the Bible, but my Jesus is okay with me doing whatever sin. My Jesus is understanding with me on this. He gets it. It's fine. He gets it. It's like that horrible ad campaign that was ran during the Super Bowl that he gets us. I'm sure they had the greatest of intent with that and trying to get people to follow Christ. Well, guess what? It was a horrible approach. It was a horrid approach. At the end of the day, what we need to know is this. Is our world so far gone to the point where there's just no point? Anymore? No, we don't know that. We don't know when that time is. Only God does. What does this mean for the Christian? It means we continue doing what Jesus said to do over 2,000 years ago. And that was to go out into all the world and make disciples of all nations. I know a lot of Christians are sometimes afraid when it comes to spreading the gospel, especially to a hostile group of people. But what you do in those times, you need to understand a few things. One, we don't save people. God saves people. He will use us to spread that message. But at the end of the day, if somebody doesn't believe after you have given them the gospel and offered to disciple them and show them the ways of Christ and they refuse to believe, it's not because you did something wrong. It's because they made that choice, plain and simple. They have hardened their own hearts. And a lot of times, as we see in the Bible, when people harden their own hearts, God goes ahead and hardens it even more. In other words, they have already made up their mind. But who knows, maybe, maybe, just maybe, they don't respond right away. How often have you ever been told you were wrong on something and refused to believe it? Only to come back to it later, let it fester for a few days, actually look it up, and then realize you were wrong and come back and say, all right, you know what? I was wrong, you were right. A lot of people have a sense of pride, the bad kind of pride, where you are told and honestly, you might even know it at that exact time that you're wrong, but you just won't admit it. But then it sits there and it festers and you think about it and then maybe you even study it just to come back later on and apologize for how you acted and admit that you were wrong. It's happened to me before. It's kind of the same way when you go out there and you give the gospel to maybe a very hostile group of people who you know on initial hearing may not believe. And then they don't believe, but it sits there. You could have just one planted a seed or two watered a seed that is just growing very, very slowly. I often go back to Jesus' parable of the sower. You know, the focus of that parable was not on the sower itself, but rather on the soil in which the seeds land. The focus wasn't on the sower. The focus wasn't on the seeds. The focus was on where that seed landed. We can't determine that. We just go out there and start growing seeds. We don't know if it's going to land on the solid paved road where birds come and snatch it up away before it even has a chance to do anything. We don't know if it's going to land on the rocky soil that can't get enough root into the ground and blow away at the first sign of trouble and turbulence. We don't know if it's going to land in the thorny soil where weeds start to choke out the truth after it's taken root. We don't know if it's gonna land on good soil and produce a crop that's gonna yield fruit. God does. And what we need to do is trust in God when it comes to that. Now, this isn't meaning to say that every single person is gonna be saved because the Bible's clear. Not every single person will be saved because not every single person will believe. 
It's not our job to judge and discern who we preach to. We just preach. And if we keep preaching and we keep spreading the gospel and we keep trying to make disciples of all the nations, we are doing the will of God. Whether they convert over or not is going to be between them and God. All that to say this, when you go out to spread the gospel, don't be afraid that you're going to do it wrong. And that's the sole reason why this person never comes to salvation because of you. Instead, look at all the biblical examples of when we see the gospel being given. These people become filled with the Holy Spirit and they preach boldly. God takes over at that point. God knows exactly what they need to hear at that time for those who will come to believe. Don't think of yourselves any more than just the tool that God uses. Lastly, if you are an unbeliever and you're living for yourself and saying life's short, get a divorce, then just know that in Christ, life isn't short, so you don't need to get that divorce. You can have either eternal life with Christ, with the fullness of joy, or you can have eternal life without him in what has to be the most agonizing pain. Thank you.